Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, super excited to dive into our panel on inclusive benefits and how it can help attract and retain a diverse workforce. Obviously, a really interesting time right now in corporate America when it comes to anything in the uh, diversity realm. And also, we know America is diversifying, so really important to dive into this. So I'm going to go down the line and ask each of you all to uh, introduce yourselves briefly and share um, what your role is, and then we'll, we'll dive into the conversation. So Deb, I'll start with you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Deb Foley. I am the director of DEIB, which is Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Walters Clore. Um, I'll have a little bit of a different perspective. I will focus more on inclusive benefits versus the benefit side, although I work very closely with um, my, actually my leader is uh, the leader of our benefits for our company. So we work hand in hand and very closely. So have a unique and different perspective. Hi everyone, Jillian Plummer from Quest Diagnostics. I head our employee health and well-being. Um, we have 50,000 employees, 40,000 are frontline workers. I just heard um, the woman before talking about how do you engage your um, shift workers frontline. We have first, second, and third shift. It's not easy, but we are um, on our way to making some strides. So been with Quest for about six years. Um, I am a marketer turned HR professional. So how about that? Okay. Corinne. Um, Corinne Hobbs, General Manager of the Employer Market for Ovia Health, which is also a subsidiary of LabCorp. We um, really, we're a digital app or a digital solution that provides 24-7 support for women and families um, with a strong focus on DEI and B. So I'm very excited to not only share some thoughts like my colleagues in terms of the employer market, but also to share what some point solutions are doing in the market. Hi everybody, my name is Britt Barney. I'm from North Star. We're a financial wellness company uh, working with employees from, or employers from 200 employees up to 30,000 employees. So um, a little bit of a different kind of what I'm seeing versus what we're doing. Hi everyone, I'm Anita Danwada. I uh, work for Graystar, which is a property management and real estate organization. Um, I've been with Graystar for two years as their managing director of Global Total Rewards, and under that umbrella falls compensation, of course, benefits, um, performance management, and global mobility. So a fairly large area, but you know, kind of the, the, the common theme around everything that we're doing is surrounding ourselves around, with DEI and how to really embed that into our culture and all the programs that we roll out for our employees. So excited to speak more with all of you about that today. Awesome. So before we drill down a bit, um, let's get a high level view of the benefit space and particularly how it intersects with, um, you know, inclusivity. Deb, I think you have a really interesting perspective here from your um, from your seat. So why don't you kick us off? OK, so um, we made a decision about seven, eight months ago to actually um, move DEIB into our um, benefits, wellness, recognition um, and uh, Total, it's part of the total rewards, yeah. Um, and part of that is similar to my colleague here, thinking about how we embed DEIB into everything we do, but clearly needing a focus of how do we drive our culture, right? How do we embed DEIB in everything we do to build a more inclusive culture? And we really saw so much connection between benefits and wellness and DEIB. So um, we work hand in hand. Um, I look at almost and work with almost everything they roll out. Um, we have an ear um, into the organization. So we listen to our employees who tell us what they need and want. So it's very, very um, fluid, very, um, uh, Integra integrate is the best word to describe yeah. it. You, you almost have to like meet your employees where they are, right? Mm -hmm. So we have at Quest, um, I've been on this brigade to help infuse our culture of wellness, health and wellness. And what we've done is we've launched 11 employee business networks. And so our, our employee business networks cater from um, diverse abilities to, um, you know, Pan-Asian leaders. And so that right there is just, in, you know, 
helping our employees, meeting our employees where they are, it's very important. We actually just launched an employee business network. And these are networks where we have 5,000, 8,000 employees involved in it. And it's across the country. Um, we have local ambassadors. And, and we're talking like, one, like marketing 101 here. Like this is grassroots marketing, but it's infusing a culture and it's involving employees. They're leaders in their own regions across, um, across America too. But we just launched our health and wellness, um, Healthy Quest. Um, employee business network, and I got to tell you, we have peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Our employees want to talk to each other. I've had employees laughing, crying, venting, um, and it just personalizes that experience and includes that you know employee within the company and conversation. So it's been a really big success for us over the last year and a half. Excellent. And now let's kind of dive into some of these specific ones. And you know, given the statistics, I think you know everyone in this room probably um, either has experienced this themselves or knows someone that has. Talking about fertility and that journey to parenthood, um, Karina, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about how the kind of um, you know the gold standard for benefits related to the path to parenthood has kind of evolved recently. Like, where are we now? How did we get here? Sure. Um, I'd love to talk about that. So, <laughs> um, you know, the benefit space is really changing, right? Um, first, I just want to anchor in what's happening. We're seeing medical cost trends rise. Um, I'm sure everybody is experiencing that. Um, maternity costs are one of the biggest areas, right? Behind cancer, diabetes, and all of those others. Um, additionally, employees are currently asking um, their employers to do more, right? Like they, with inflation and all that's going on, um, employers are, employees are demanding more from their employers. In fact, 38% of employees would consider moving to another job for better benefits. As it relates to um, fertility, maternity, and beyond, what we're finding is that it's really important to support all paths to parenthood. Um, that, you know, and even beyond just thinking about black maternal health and the LGBTQIA plus community, there's also a growing portion of single parents by choice. So a lot of the laws in terms of the core benefits um, or policies related to core benefits don't necessarily align to these diverse families. So really ensuring that the benefit, uh, especially the core benefits, that they cover all populations, not only to include those that I mentioned, but also part-time workforces and beyond, that everybody has the same opportunity in terms of infertility, um, treatments and beyond, surrogacy, adoption, all of these are quite costly. Um, so that's one big piece, but then also um, just ensuring that you have those supports once um, a successful pregnancy and or adoption occurs, right? What are your return to work policies look like? Are they equitable? Are you offering um, flexible work options? Parental leave for all. There are so many things. Um, we're finding that what really supports um, safety net in terms of these is having digital solutions like Ovia Health, but there's others, right? Um, but really it's important because that way there's 24 seven access. It goes beyond geography. It goes beyond race and support and supports your entire workforce. Yeah. And you mentioned costs and a huge cost for many people is the cost of housing. Um, I just heard upwards talk about how child care is outpacing the cost of housing um, in all 50 states. That is mind blowing because when you think about your budget, most of it goes to where you live. Um, so I know that that's a pain point for employees. And Amitha, I want to touch on how your organization has kind of addressed this. Um, you have a housing benefit. How did that come together? Talk to me about that. Yeah. So a couple of years back in 2022, we, you know, we had a, a meeting with our executive leaders and they really thought that that we had very competitive benefits that we were offering. So we decided to do a benefit survey mm -hmm. and really get that feedback from our employees to hear what's top of mind for all of them. And the results that came back were jarring when our executives saw it. And you know, one of the good things with Gray Stars is that we have an executive team that really does care about doing the right thing for our employees and being able to properly support them in their journeys, whatever that may be. Um, so we actually, in 2023, last year, rolled out several enhancements to our benefits, um, kind of along the lines of parental benefits. We introduced a gender-neutral um, paid parental leave policy where regardless of you know whether you're the birthing parent or non-birthing parent, if you end up in a situation where you are the primary caregiver to that child, then you are eligible for the full 16 weeks of paid uh, 
uh, parental leave. Um, another one, of course, is the housing. Um, we, being in the real estate property management space, of course, you know, one of the, the best ways that we thought we can actually help employees be able to you know, improve their affordability was to be able to provide a discount to you know the folks who are working on site at our properties. Um, so we we rolled that out back uh, a year year and a half ago um, with a forty percent discount for any employees who are working on site at the properties that they're managing, and for those who are looking to live at a different property from the one that they're managing, we are offering up to twenty percent discount for them, and that's been received very well across the board and um, has actually improved our attrition numbers incredibly well. Love yeah. that. And Britt, I want to bring you in as well. Um, does your organization also offer something in the housing realm? or? So we don't, but we work with a, a variety of different companies, and I think housing is becoming, like, I was like, a 40% discount on <laughs> Where I live? Like, are you guys married? <laughs> I would love, no. like, yeah, no wonder yes. people aren't leaving. What an amazing benefit. But what we're seeing, and I don't work with a ton of clients in the real estate space, not every company has the ability to do something like that. But I think companies have realized, as Corinne said, like, employees expect a lot. Mm -hmm. They want everything to come from work. And they kind of have to because it's not really coming from anywhere else. And so what I've seen is a lot more... Um, like preferred rates on mortgages, discounted like bank relationship type things. And one of the things that we talk a lot about clients with in our, so we have um, certified financial planners at North Star and we offer them as a employee benefit. And one of the things our planners always ask when we get asked to consult on benefits is, is this a marketing tool for the bank or the lender? Or is this an employee benefit that actually benefits employees? And sometimes I have gone back to a client and said, our planning team, does not think that this is something that benefits your employees. But we have seen a lot of housing discounts, um, preferred relationships, and then what we'll do is come in and say, that's, that's great. A preferred rate is amazing, but it does not matter if you can't afford the house. The housing, owning a home is like the American dream. That does not mean it is right for everyone. And so what we come in and do is an education to say, okay, maybe you can afford the down payment, but can you then afford to furnish that house, heat that house, replace the roof, pay the taxes? What does that look like? And so making sure that we're helping people achieve their dream, like the dream that is right for them. And I think employers are helping with that kind of first step of getting the foot in the door. And then we've really been able to come in and say like, yes, this is an amazing product that your company offers and you shouldn't use it mm. because it doesn't align with your specific life values, financial situation right now. But I am seeing a ton more housing related uh, benefits coming out. I love that. And Nisa, I want to circle back to something that you said and throw it open to the group, but you mentioned a survey kind of informing a decision. So can, um, you know, does anyone want to chime in on a time when data, you guys have used data or similar situations to develop um, some type of benefit and how, how that's panned out? Or maybe perhaps tweak a benefit if you got feedback that, you know, it wasn't working anymore. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. We, yeah, no, we structure. So the way that we um, look at our benefits, um, you know, every day we're at Quest. I have an email from a vendor. I know there's a lot of vendors <laughs> here. It's all good. We're all friends. <laughs> um, but we offer, um, we have a product called Blueprint for Wellness. We sell it to employers as well. Um, and it's an annual screening for our employees. We scan over 100 biomarkers. We do a health risk assessment. And we're able to see, based off of the de-identified de data, um, how many employees, where employees are that have type 2 diabetes, weight management, um, mental health, so we screen anxiety, depression, um, fertility, uh, we, we go through the gamut of it and then we're able to, back to marketing, segment out the populations that need that care and then take that data and market to them, which vendors, kind of to your point, it's not maybe for everyone, but um, market to our employees on what um, could be right for them given that you know, our highest costs at Quest are oncology and type 2 diabetes. So that is something that we're focused really hard on. How do we, how do we um, change behavior in chronic conditions and using data to inform that? So we we'll see something similar. So part of what we do is when you have a, a conversation with a financial advisor, they'll report on what did we talk about? You know, what was the big thing that came up? Was it health insurance? Was it budgeting? And then we report all of that back to the employer and I can go to them and say, hey, a ton of people are asking questions mm -hmm. about how to buy a home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here are some things that I've seen other people implement. Like here are some different tools that we've seen. Um, we often will see it with retirement. And then we say, okay, maybe it's time to like beef up retirement education or do some type of market. It, 
benefits is marketing. It's Literally, marketing. I was a marketer before I was in HR, <laughs> yeah. so it's fine. Um, and so we kind of have that open feedback loop where they'll come to us and say, hey, we're getting a ton of questions about uh, Secure 2.0 and uh, savings or like loan repayment and getting a 401k match. How can you help us educate? So we have kind of that back and forth open feedback loop of saying, these are the things that people are asking about. This is what the data is showing us. Yeah. What tools do you already have that maybe we're not doing a good enough job explaining? Or where are your blind spots? Where can we help you fill in we those just, gaps? Yeah, we just launched a financial benefit um, a little late last year because our employees on our health risk assessment, the number one stressor for our employees was financial mm -hmm. wellness. And so we were like, oh my gosh, we have to help our employees. And that's like, not unique it, to you guys. You don't have to feel bad about that. I think I was, that's the number one stressor <laughs> yeah. at every single it, So company. we launched a financial wellness solution mm -hmm. and we're seeing, like, I mean, the engagement rate is very high in this program mm -hmm. right now. So. Yeah, we also do something very similar. We do um, benefit audits every, mm -hmm. pretty much every year where we you know, take the pulse of where we are in the marketplace. And one of the things we found is around financial wellness um, and particularly those people who graduate from college with debt, a lot of us, right? Um, and they <laughs> struggle to save money. Mm -hmm. um, and they can't contribute to a 401k plan because they're paying off their student debt. So we just introduced a new benefit in the US um, for those employees who are currently paying off student loans. They can um, get matched because you only get matched, the company match, if you pay into our 401k. Well, now we are matching the up to 3%, which is our current match. Um, if they are paying off their student loans. So huge benefit for our employees, really well received, especially for the um, early career mm -hmm. students who are graduating with a lot of debt. So, and that was based on um, some marketplace data yep. that we received. I love that. Okay, I mentioned this at the top of the conversation, but we kind of are in a moment in corporate America where we are seeing some companies retreating when it comes to DEI initiatives. Um, and there's like a lot of overlap between benefits and, you know, as we've been talking about inclusivity and making sure that things, um, you know, apply to a lot of different folks and a lot of different families. Um, so, I mean, I would love to hear all of your, you know, whoever wants to chime in's thoughts on, you know, how is your organization responding to that shift in the landscape? You know, have you made any changes? What are you hearing from your peers? Like, tell us the gossip. And then, uh, Deb, maybe I'll start with you, given your... Given your, my role. So role. I have to tell you, it's a little scary being in DEIB <laughs> these days. Um, but, you know, the good thing is, if you don't make it a standalone big thing, right, but you integrate it into everything you do, it becomes a part of the fabric mm -hmm. of your organization. Right? It becomes part of the culture. So as we think about making decisions within our organization, we always apply a DEIB lens. Um, so it's not, hey, this isn't inclusive. It's, we don't even have to use the big labels and the big you know, words DEIB because we all know that it is you know, um, under fire these days. Um, and so what we have done is really question almost everything we do with a lens to DEIB, but without having to um, put a label on it. And, and that's really helped us to keep the focus and to integrate it into, you know, the fabric, the culture, um, as opposed to, you know, um, I, I would say, you know, highlighting everything we do and making it about DEIB. It's about doing the right thing for our employees, not necessarily because it's going to check a box or because it's going to make us look good. It's about doing the right thing. Yeah, and we had very similar conversations at our organization. And, you know, when we looked at this earlier this year, we realized that, you know, of course, all the initiatives taking place in the DEI uh, space were important, but it does touch on so many different aspects of what we all do at work that when we had those conversations, we realized, you know what, is there really a need to have a label of DEI or do we just say, you know what, this is so embedded in our culture already that we want to make sure people understand that part. So our DEI team, um, you know, we're talking about labels, but <laughs> we, did, we did move away from calling them DEI 
-hmm. and more calling them CIE, which is culture, inclusion, and engagement, where the culture part of it actually does embed so much of the work that's happening in the DEI space. Yeah, we've even moved away from DEIB. We just now focus on belonging yeah. because we want all of our employees, whether you know, you're know Hispanic, black, you know, whatever your gender is, whatever you identify with, we want you to feel a sense of belonging and that the company cares about you. So we're actually just kind of sometimes dropping the DEI and just using the belonging. And I would say that from a landscape perspective, um, you know, just framing this just a little bit more, what's the impact of focusing on this and embedding it in your fiber, right? Um, really, there is um, a 30% decrease in absenteeism, a 35% increase in productivity, but then also when you have people who can bring their full selves to work um, and you have diverse populations, I, it was reported by Pew Research that there's a 30% increase in innovation, right? So if you really want to drive your companies forward, it's important to embed this, I love that, embed this in the fiber of your organization. We, so going back to what I was saying when we, we were first, uh, I think it was like your first question was, we have 11 employee business networks. It goes to all of this DEI. We cater toward every walk of life at Quest. We actually fund our employee business networks financially with funds to do events, to do um, whatever they would like across the um, organization. We structure them in, there's co-chairs, there's executive um, sponsors, there's advisors, and we really take a stance on, on that. Like I said, we have thousands and thousands of employees that are in each of these um, networks across the organization. And we're talking like frontline employees. Mm -hmm. And so that's very powerful there too. I love that. And you know, we hear this a lot, you know, people may be, um, I hear this feedback in the stories that I write a lot is just, you know, people might have a uh, bristle a little bit when there is policies that are rolled out that don't necessarily apply to them or don't necessarily benefit them. So I would love to hear a little bit about kind of you, how you go about that balance. Okay, we want to address the needs of the widest number of employees, but you're still trying to be targeted. Um, Britt, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, this is something I think about a lot, because um, I come from the financial world, and we were talking earlier, and someone said, oh, it's very pale, male, and stale. And I thought, that's unkind and true. Um, and so when I think about financial wellness, there's a whole subset of people who on purpose have felt like it's not for them, because it's not. If you weren't wealthy, white, older, it wasn't for you. And so when I think about benefits like that, when someone says, I don't need a financial advisor, it's like, well, you probably actually do. And so I think about and see benefits where it's broadly applicable, but extremely customizable. So, and I can speak to, to financial wellness, everybody needs it. Like it doesn't matter if you have $30 or $30 million, you need some guidance, but you wanna make sure that employees feel reflected in the benefits that you have. And one of the things that's been really important to us from a DEI lens is hiring a very diverse planner population. Because traditionally you walk into an office and it's white and it's male. And something that's been really important to us is to have planners that reflect uh, the outside world. So if you would like to work with a woman of color, you can do that. If you would like to work with someone from the LGBTQIA community, you can do that. And so one of the things that we've seen when we've um, advised on benefits for our clients and looked at benefits is to say, is this broadly applicable, yet also can make people feel like they're having an individual experience? And um, I think people generally can be like, I'm not gonna have kids, but I understand that's an important benefit. <laughs> like you hope people are generous yeah. in some of this because you offer enough things that are applicable to the broader population, but we've really found that um, showing people, their own reflection in the things that are offered to them has been massively impactful with adoption and just like positive feelings about what a company is offering. I love that. And, um, you know, would love to hear also about balancing the business needs versus the benefit. So Graystar, I know, has a sabbatical program. You know, people are going to be out of the office, out of their seat for some chunk of time. Um, how does a company go about approaching that? Obviously, wonderful carrot to have to be able to go do that, but at the same time, someone does have to then backfill that work. Yeah, so there's actually lots of guidance that our people and culture team has put together for individuals who are gonna be in that situation. Um, we Number one, we give an entire full year for the individual to decide when they're gonna take that six-week sabbatical. Um, 
and they'll of course have to work very closely with their managers to make sure that you know they have the proper coverage they put together a transition plan to say here are all the things that I'm responsible for here's exactly how to go about getting these things done and properly managing that transition for the individuals who are going to be taking over some of those tasks um, we do also ask managers to make sure they put in a budget um, because we do know for 2025 who exactly is eligible for this benefit so let's start planning beforehand so that if you don't have enough bandwidth on your existing team, you can plan to get a contractor to come in during that time. So there's a lot of conversation happening around that to make sure that they are as prepared as possible for when that time does come. Got it. Any other of um, you all have examples on how that kind of uh, towing that line works and you know um, how you all have navigated that? Does anyone else want to chime in? I have a quick Great, yeah. just quick story. I was with a client last week and she had a really, really interesting perspective on how she thinks about her dollars and like the budget that she can spend. And she said, my job is not to give my employees a benefit that they could get for the same cost outside of the office. Mm -hmm. My job is to say, I have X amount of dollars for every employee. What is the best use of this money? What could I do? because I'm bulk buying for my 10,000 employees that I could get so much less expensively than my employee could go out and get it and bundling all of that and not going and saying, here's our health renewal, which was up 60%, which was theirs was up 60%. So I had a little, they went self-funded. It made a lot more sense. But she said, okay, instead of saying, okay, here's the health budget, getting approval for that, and then coming back and saying, here's my budget for mental wellness, here's my budget for this, bundling it all together and presenting that to leadership and saying, you know, here's every single dollar we're spending on benefits Here's why it aligns with the um, personal like, feelings of the people that work there and also the overall corporate. And here's how it positively impacts and provides benefits to our employees that they couldn't get elsewhere. And that seemed to be, that kind of was a light bulb for me because I don't think of like, oh yeah, you're getting bulk discounts on things that I can't afford mm -hmm. out in the open market. Um, and that was a really interesting way to kind of balance like giving employees things that are unique and uh, helpful and practical and necessary, but also keeping in mind budgets, mm -hmm. um, you know, corporate priorities and all of those types of different things. And that was a unique perspective that I hadn't heard often. And the one thing I would just add to the sabbatical piece and the planning around it, it's not any different than how we would handle parental leave as mm. well, right? Um, parental leaves, in fact, are longer at Graystar than the sabbatical is, right. but the approach in terms of planning for it wouldn't be any different. Um, so really just making sure that you're aware, making sure that you have proper coverage, you're being able to upskill uh, other team members to be able to step in and take, um, take over those responsibilities, um, all kind of falls under that broader leave umbrella. Got it. Yeah, I think we're at Quest. We have, <clears throat> you know, we, we have a lot of employees. We have high health care costs right now, um, like everyone does. And so we really take this segmented approach at what our highest cost claimants are, the data behind that, and then installing the benefits that are going to work for that population. We try to be as diverse as possible. We have a lot of benefits. Actually, a lot of our employees sometimes just don't even know what benefits they have. Mm -hmm. And so you have to then break it down, especially in our very matrixed organization at Quest, break it all the way down to middle management and say, you know, here, you know, here's what your, your employees have, you know, our HR business partners across the country do the same. Um, but we take a very segmented approach. For example, I was saying earlier, type two diabetes is our, our second highest cost right now. Um, and so what are we going to do to one, I want to help our employees. I want them to live a healthy, healthy life with them and their families. Um, and then two, what are we doing to care for them? And how do we cut that cost down for us too? So yeah. and I would it's a double it. It's, you yeah. know, it's like, balancing act of corporate America, but also we're people, we're humans. How do we help each other out? And like you had said earlier, our employees are coming to us for help. Mm -hmm. They're coming to us. And I'm just gonna piggyback off of what you said for just a second. Um, one of the things we've realized is as opposed to treating somebody with diabetes, it's a lot cheaper to take care of them. 
to provide wellness and support. So we are really amping up our wellness programs, um, making sure people understand weight loss and nutrition and um, making sure that they understand stress-related um, issues and how to deal and address with those, those issues. So we have really amped up our whole wellness. We had a wellness week, we rolled it out, we um, use our employee networks, we have several of them as well, to actually share their stories, we use storytelling, and they talk to people. Really important, storytelling. Yes. And they yeah. talk to the, the other employees. So it's easier for, it's easy for me to stand up on stage and talk, yeah. but it's so much more impactful to have our employees talk well, and tell about yeah. the benefits and, and how they use them. One thing we did, I'll just, I just want to mention this. So last year, um, I had 11 large, large um, wellness organizations fly out to our headquarters is in Secaucus. We had a Healthy Quest Health and Wellness Summit. I had executives in the meeting. I had middle management. I had our phlebotomists, our, our couriers in the meeting. We were trying to identify, and we used the decision matrix to do this, which program to implement. I had Apple there, Google, Fitbit, Weight Watchers, Noom. What our employees want. We launched Weight Watchers. We have a 60, I'm not trying to like promote them, but I'm just saying like this was so fascinating. We have a 63% engagement rate for Weight Watchers. Our population's 80% female. Um, and we're, you know, and, and that right there, that was missing at Quest. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like this is wild right now, but this is what our employees want. And we wouldn't have found that out if we did not do our research and benchmarking. So yeah, yeah. there's, there's a lot I, of great products out there, but. Just to add yeah. on to that quickly, I think, I, first of all, I love this discussion around wellness and well-being and all the programs that all, various companies are implementing. And I think what that ultimately is going back to, just to get on my soapbox a little bit, <laughs> is the, the, the healthcare system in yeah. the country really is focused on sick care, yeah. which is actually taking care of people and focused on more of a preventative approach, mm -hmm. where that ownership is really falling on the employers now. 100%. To be able to say, how do we actually reduce these claims, mm -hmm. that the cost that we're seeing for oncology yeah. and diabetes and heart disease, right? Um, and, and all of the things that, that you all are talking about with the different programs that you're implementing are really coming at it from that angle, yeah, which you, is you, amazing. You are so right with that, though. Yeah, and I wanted to kind of follow up on something that has kind of come up in this conversation is this idea of employers um, kind of stepping into a lot of arenas that maybe they didn't before. And I think that's just kind of interesting. Like now, you know, as we have many generations in the office, there are generations that are, you know, new workers that are coming in that kind of expect certain things from their employers that didn't necessarily exist however many years ago. Um, Karina, I'll start with you. Do you want to talk a little bit about kind of this perspective of, um, you know, employers kind of expanding the scope of what they bring to the table for their workers, yeah. Sure, um, so you know, there's really a large focus and impetus towards the traditional benefits, which are the core benefits and expanding those, but then also looking at societal changes and um, also equity, right? Um, and equity, not just in terms of DEI, but as I mentioned earlier, serving an entire population, understanding that our employers are not homogenous. We're seeing expansion into financial benefits, um, environmental needs. People really care about sustainability. They want to work for companies that align with their values. And we're seeing a lot of that with millennials and beyond, and they're choosing their employers based on that, but then also on different policies like parental leave, um, you know, FFB, uh, fertility and family building benefits. Um, flexible work schedules is a big thing that's coming up. We all heard the news um, regarding some employers bringing their employees back, right? Um, but people are making choices based on this, and it's really important to consider as a company, you know, like what are the core, who are you trying to attract? What are the needs of those, of those employees? There's a lot of information to be gained, as they mentioned in terms of the ERGs. Um, that's the, one of the best places to go to really understand what's driving employer decisions, but then and also, the other piece of it is, is that they're looking for a lot of personalization, right? So you've got your core benefits, but then augmenting them with different vendors and or point solutions can help to really ensure that you're meeting the needs of all your populations. One thing with point solutions that we see is really driving engagement, right? Um, that's how they're usually um, looked at. And in terms of that, 
you know, one of the other things I wanted to piggyback actually on one of your questions from earlier, reaching a swath of persons. Um, it's really about the communication of those benefits, right? When we were in the green room, we were talking about home mailers, right? Like yeah. what really works in terms of making sure that people have awareness of these benefits yep. mm -hmm. that are available to them? Because it's not necessarily that they're wrong. Engagement doesn't mean that it's wrong. And also, you know, with things in like Ovia, right? Like there's cost savings to be related, r related to it, right? If you save one preterm birth, that's, you know, $95,000 right there off of your medical cost trend. Avoidance of ART and beyond, preeclampsia, but then also diabetes. So just thinking about these things holistically, the bundled approach really is helpful when looking at benefits. We always say seven times, seven different ways at Quest because mm -hmm. literally like we, our employees don't read their emails. They do not read their emails. They absolutely do not. And so we need to literally put a flyer up in a break room, mm -hmm. put a flyer in the laboratory. We have over 30 laboratories across the country. Literally there's like just little flyers and we have the team switch them out, but it's just back to basics. We try to get, we try to complicate so much, I feel yes. like. Yes. And it's just like getting back to the the basics of it. We yeah. find that employees are overwhelmed because oh, yeah. you guys are doing such a good job and spending so much money and so much time and putting so much effort into building these amazing benefits packages and then employees are like, yeah, I have health and 401k and I don't know what right. else to do. It's and overwhelming. I think like how, and it is complex and explaining to them kind of like that benefits ecosystem and mm -hmm. here's how the benefits play together and here's how like this one can serve you in this way and maybe give you guidance on this other benefit and helping employees understand like why something was designed the way it was and how those benefits can interact can drive engagement across all of your benefits not just one you know vendor or provider and that's been that holistic education has been really huge. And that's, let's not overlook, um, you know, you've got the benefit subscriber, but then you've got the additional dependent. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not the subscriber that right. needs the benefit, speaking from experience with the women's health app, right? Mm. Yeah. Sometimes it's not the subscriber, it's the actual dependents. How do you reach those other people right. that would benefit from the benefit? And then also, <laughs> right? And then also um, reduce cost trends, yeah. create uh, attraction and retention of employees. So I think that's one thing that we just can't overlook in this conversation. And I'll just add that, you know, I think you mentioned it earlier. We, you know, the, um, I would call it the hyper customization. The, and, and why that's so important is because today, we now have six generations in the workforce. It's the first time ever that we've had such a diverse workforce. What does that mean? It means some people are older. And you know what? We have issues around menopause and we have issues around caregiving for our parents who, by the way, if you've been through that, it is tough. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then you have the kids, kids, so not diverse. Don't um, the younger generation. <laughs> uh, don't yeah. anybody sh can you strike that from the? Uh, yeah. um, uh, you have the younger generation who's coming out of school, and they are buried with debt, and they have all kind and, and housing concerns. My kids can't afford to live it, where they grew up. So there's all these challenges that are really um, converging. Um, now and how do you as an employer meet all of those unique and different needs? Very well said and just to bring us home I'm going to ask each of you to just quickly say one word about where you see the future of benefits going. One word. Um, hyper customization. Progressive. I was going to definitely say personalization. Yeah, I, I was too. I'm trying to come up with something else. Inclusive, more inclusive. Oh, I was going to say that oh, too. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can double tap on I it. Know. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to say the same thing. I yeah. know everything yeah. you said. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we'll leave it there. So much to dive into. Thank you all for the time and Thank appreciate you. you all listening. Thank, Thank you. you.